How many of you listeners are on a first name basis with your plumber or electrician? After all, they're the ones installing your energy efficient hot water heater and fixing your solar panels when something goes wrong. This is the Levers for Change podcast. My name is Jimmy Gio. Today's guest is Brewster Earl. Brewster spent 18 years at Comfort System USA, a $2 billion public company and the largest mechanical contractor in the US. He was president of their energy services division. It was his job to sell energy efficiency. Let's listen to the challenges that he faced connecting the wires and pipes to the people and leadership. Well, Brewster, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you be a part of the podcast. Oh, my pleasure, Jimmy. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Comfort System USA is a $2 billion public company, and it's probably a $2 billion public company that no one has ever heard of before. How would you describe what a mechanical contractor is, what an MEP is, and just give us a little bit of a grounding and a framework? Sure, absolutely. When you think about heating your house, heating buildings, cooling buildings, cooling your house, that's mechanical. That's all mechanical systems that provide that. And somebody's got to install them. Comfort Systems happens to be working the commercial sector. They don't do residential work. But the way to frame it is, you know, if the building you go to work in, the house you're living in, if it's hot, if it's cool when it needs to be, when it, if it's comfortable, uh, mechanical contractors install those systems in the buildings and then maintain them. And so then how does that mechanical, electrical, plumbing work together? Those are three different engineering systems that are coming together. How does those three in conjunction bring complexities to the projects that you have to pursue? Sure, that, that's a, a really good question. Interestingly, there's a lot of innate conflicts in construction and building, right? Because there's different trades that come together and they're elbow to elbow making something out of a plot of land. And they all have kind of different agendas and the conflicts are resolved through the project management process, whereby these systems do have to integrate to some level. So an electrical system would allow a heating and cooling system to operate because it has to be connected to electricity. Plumbing, when you're thinking about plumbing everything, a lot of heating and cooling relies on the plumbing to, to transfer water or other liquids throughout the building. So these are all integrated systems that need to work together and efficiently and interestingly the dynamics of these competing trades create the conflicts is the plumber wants to be in this location but it has to be staged and then when the plumber's done can the electrician get in behind then can the heating and cooling contractor get in behind so it all has to be well coordinated at the build stage and, and at the design stage quite frankly is there generally a order to when the mechanical the electrical and the plumbing trades come into play is that generic or is that on a case-by-case -case basis? There is definitely an order, and there are definitely, you know, sequences that naturally occur in the built environment. For a simple, simple example, the electricians and plumbers have to get in there before the sheetrockers and painters do their work, obviously. So that, that's a very kind of visceral example of what I'm explaining. But coordinating the, the tradesmen into the space to do their work, it's going to likely be case to case so there are some generics involved it depends on access it depends on the, the equipment etc but that all is the responsibility of the project manager the construction managers to coordinate all that and that's where the planning on the front end comes so the schedule is built and that's how it's executed just to give us a sense of scale what would be the largest projects you're working on i'm thinking possibly skyscrapers or campuses and then what would be the smallest projects that you would be working on Sure. When I was at Comfort Systems, interestingly, and I, this is all in their public documents, the average project size was, you know, if I recall, I'm going to be directionally there in the half a million dollar range. That's on average, but Comfort Systems would also have $100 million, $60 million, 50, perhaps a $50 million job. So that scale, those would be, you know, two, three year installations. They'll also, a mechanical contractor would also be involved in a one day project where you're replacing a part of a, an air conditioning system on a Starbucks, for example. So it, it, it's a huge difference, a huge continuum of project size. 
And so, you know, that's engineering complexity of what it takes to build the system. Let's get into some of the organizational complexities. Comfort system runs based on operating companies in different locales and 35 operating units in 115 cities. And you were one of the executives managing and running this organization. So what are some of the complexities of running a national organization that is very local in its staff and people and expertise? Approach that Comfort Systems takes today still, certainly when I was there, is to hire or to acquire really good companies in the different locales, to hire the, and attract the best people they can, and then allow them to run their local businesses. So the challenge then comes in, how do you proliferate best practices? How do you capture best practices? And how do you get companies to um, you make changes to continuously improve? The challenge in the construction business, from my observations, I, I'm sure it's not necessarily true of every company, but it's a pretty simple business, construction, when you think about it. And to keep it simple becomes a challenge, but that is kind of the golden standard is let's keep this business as simple as we can. Let's, let's do what we say we're going to do. Let's execute the work and let's do it in the most profitable man, manner that we can to deliver what the customer expects. So when we think about those elements, it's really assigning best practices, efficiencies, and getting folks to adopt them in a very simple business that they've been successful in. I'd say that's the primary challenge. Is people have made a living doing what they're doing. So how do we continue to evolve and present best practices in such a way that people see value? And when you say best practices, you're talking about not just technical best practices of, hey, here's the state of the art of how to install a new water heater. It's also managerial best practices of, hey, here's how you you know run the back office of your organization, right? Or a little bit of both. It's definitely a little bit of both. It's, you know, how do we how do we properly account as a publicly traded company in the case of comfort systems? And what are some of the latest emerging technical advances that we can adopt without disrupting our business or managing the disruption? And so it's both of those things for sure. The thing I do want to mention is it's a people business, honestly. And safety is such a huge thing in the construction industry. And I know it's top of mind for, for all the very good construction companies I've ever worked with. So being able to manage and operate in a safe, make sure people are going home at the end of the day. So a lot of the managerial aspects are about that. How do you train? How do you develop? And how do you make sure people are continuing to work safely? Do you have any examples of what a safety control would be, what a safety policy would be? Sure. So there are very prescriptive safety procedures when you're if you can picture people working on lifts or working with cranes you know where there's danger involved first of all osha regulates occupational safety and health administration regulates you know fundamental best practices and many other companies have different means and methods that they be sure that they're sure that these are implemented consistently on job sites so when you think about people in a lift, are they tied off properly and, and are they following the rules? And then secondly, is personal protective equipment. You know, are they wearing the proper gloves so they're minimizing cuts? Are they wearing hard hats? So the procedures are pretty straightforward, but everybody wants to do a good job. It's, you know, late in the day, they want to get home, so they want to do this last thing. So that's where the managerial aspect comes in. You know, are we establishing a culture whereby each team member is looking out for each other. And when they see an unsafe practice, do they have the courage to approach somebody and say, hey, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. Let's do this right. That's the managerial aspect. And, I, and so I think about PPE. I think about working on heights and you know, on lifts and on top of buildings and such. From doing home improvement projects, it's easy just to, at the end of the day, say, oh, I'll just do this one other thing and then not realize how exhausted you are. And that's where the accidents occur is when you're just slightly... It, unfocused. That's it, Jimmy. You're, you're, you're going to pull a chair out of the kitchen to step on the chair to, you know, replace the light fixture. And that's where things happen. You should be on a, a ladder. You know, you should be taking proper precautions. And that's exactly the mindset that you, you just described. That's what happens on construction sites where the team really has to look out for each other and, and hold each other accountable. The last system of complexity I want to get into is then the complex sale. 
you ran sales for comfort systems for many, many years. And first of all, sales is complex. And then you're doing a complex sale into a complex environment. Generally speaking, who are the buyers that you had to go and satisfy the value proposition needs? And then how did those stakeholders interact with each other and interact with you? That's interesting. We could be talking about that for a while. I, I want to qualify a few things. First of all, in the MEP business, typically people think in terms of, I'll just make a couple of buckets. One is, you know, there's construction, right? And construction can be broken out into many different delivery methods. There's design build, there's plan inspect, there's several different buckets you could create there. And then there's what I'd call kind of the owner director, the service business, which would include projects. In some iteration of that, you could talk about like energy sales, right? Energy services type of sales or replacement of large energy consuming systems. So Jimmy, to answer your question, I'll kind of go to that end of the spectrum where we're talking about, you know, when folks have a significant capital expenditure to replace larger systems that are energy consumers, that's where it does get very complex. A normal rooftop unit that sits on top of even a small to medium building, four stories, five stories, that might be a million, two million bucks, right? Or half a million, million, two million. That's already a complex sale right there. Sure. Yeah, the, the scale might be a little less than that for, for actual the heating and cooling equipment, but the bigger buildings where you're thinking, you know, in excess of 10 stories, those are significant systems. A hospital, as an example, those are significant systems where you're getting into the millions of dollars. So the decision is an important one for the owners. So your question is, who are the actual buyers? Who are the actual decision makers in that type of environment? And I'll tell you that over the course of my career, I believe that it's changed significantly. Whereas, you know, the whole the old adage was, be sure you're working with the decision maker. What I've come to realize, I think most salespeople would acknowledge is there is no the decision maker anymore. It's usually a group of people. It's usually a team. Good companies are thinking that through and making sure they're bringing in stakeholders to help make those important decisions for the business. So at the end of the day, the way I'm, I think about it is there's somebody who are responsible for the revenues of the business. There's somebody who's responsible on the cost side of the business. And, you know, most companies want to increase their revenues and they want to manage and lower their costs where possible. So those two stakeholders are almost always involved. The other stakeholders are the users, the folks who are either are responsible for keeping that building comfortable or in a production environment, keeping systems running. And sometimes there's conflicts there. It's hard to really understand who a champion might be. And that's part of the salesman's or salesperson's job is to go find who has the vested interest, who's going to make the call and who's going to really champion one design or another. When we start talking about these large systems, even within there, we're producing the MEPs, the hot water, the chilled air, these various different benefits. But all of this takes energy and it all takes a, a resource outside to be able to produce. So when you're selling one of these large systems, how much of it are you selling on the capital benefits, the capital outlay, the upfront costs? And how much are you selling on the long term operational needs, facilities, maintenance, energy resources and how do you put the two together? In my career, I had always really strived to get folks to consider the long term because they were going to make an investment they were going to be living with for 20 years or more. That is the constant dynamic is people are very sensitive to the first cost, as they should be. They should be aware and sensitive to that. And that is the reference point most people have. Most people have, no matter what they're buying, you know, they're always going to consider, hey, if this is 10% less, let me evaluate those benefits and maybe I can get it for less money. It holds true when we're talking about major building systems for most buyers. And so the opportunity I would see was let's lay out kind of good, better, best options so it doesn't appear that I'm driving an agenda. In other words, I'm happy to and would love to install your system, but let me help you make the best choice for your business. And that way I could kind of leverage if they were very cost conscious, we could have a system for them, right? Which was the low cost baseline system. If they were 
inclined to take a look at a 20 year pro forma to see what their operating costs might be and what happens when energy costs would fluctuate, energy pricing would fluctuate. We could have a better system and then a best high efficiency system. So that's the way I, I thought about going to the hopefully the right people, the right stakeholders to balance those considerations and give them options that is the best for their business. So that's that consultative sales approach where you're just helping them, giving them options to help them decide what is the best approach for them. So from that point of view, you also ran energy services for Comfort System for many years. And you you and I have had this conversation before of what's the core business? What's the core offering? Is it the mechanical system that provides the cold air or is it the energy services of the system that's providing the cold air? How are you able to... How did that make the sale of the system more complex? I've always perceived that while there's an awareness and the awareness has ebbed and flowed over time as to energy consumption and green buildings and and such, the basic business at Comfort Systems, when I was there and it still appears to be, even though they made several acquisitions, is the basic installation of these systems. And a big part of the company, it's driven by others. Those choices are made typically at the architect and engineering level who are have the primary relationship with the owner of the building or the, or the consortium who owns the building. In the energy services business, we were really trying hard to get to the same owners and give them options. Because the standard construction delivery methods, there is an inordinate focus on the first costs. So when we were working with, say, hospitals or an industrial industrial company, they are more inclined to think long term because these are not events that they're involved with year after year after year after year. So in their business, they're going to be making these large decisions, these big decisions on large systems installs, maybe once or twice a career. So they're more apt to be looking for options and go to a more design build approach than plan inspect. And so we would try to find those folks in those vertical markets where they were inclined to look long term and be very interested and open to having those choices I talked about before and then making the best decision for their business. Could you give a quick aside of the difference between design build and plan spec? Um, I think those are two ways that buildings get built. The way I think about design build, design build is when an owner hires a firm to actually design the systems and then install the systems. That's typically one firm. Then the plan and spec is where the owner hires architects and engineers to set up a set of drawings and specifications, and then they'll go to several contractors to bid to see who can install that system that they've designed and specified. What experiences have you had of just getting something and saying, this is bad design? Do you have any ability to push back if you get something that's bad design? Oh, it, well, it happens all the time in the business. It's a tap dance that folks have to play because you don't want to alienate architects and engineers and general contractors who you might work with in the future or desire to work with in the future. So I'll, I'll speak less to that dynamic and more on the design build side or where design build might enter the picture. There's been various experiences where we have seen a company would come in and specify a, a plain Jane installation. They'd be hired as the design builder. And for whatever reason, we gained access to the, the team making those decisions. And simply by giving them options, it would be revealed that the competitor would be in there really trying to get the lowest price system in there because that was their mentality. We're going to do this for as low a price as we can. And when the owners could see, hey, they have other choices on the design. And by the way, when we've experienced this particular design you're looking at, we found it to be inadequate. And so when we have those conversations, that's where we see the best chances to have folks at least acknowledge there are, there are system implications here that you're going to be living with for 20 years. So if it doesn't work right, is the low priced approach the best approach for you? And generally speaking, I think if one looks at life cycle costs, one's going to also minimize energy costs over the life cycle of that equipment. Whereas when they look at first costs, then the energy costs could be really high, could be really no, you're kind of shooting into the wind. You're not quite sure where that's going to land. Would that be correct? That's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, there's got to be an intentional effort that if you're concerned with life cycle costs and the energy consumption, you're going to be paying 
a premium over the baseline model. On the install, but maybe not Correct. over the life cycle. Then from your experience, have you seen, generally speaking, between design build and plan spec, which ones tended to generate the best energy efficient designs? I, I hesitate to make a blanket decision here because there's an awful lot of contractors now working with a great awareness to energy efficiency, life cycle costing. Generally speaking, the plan and spec has some inherent conflicts where the handoffs happen, but you know, architects, engineers, if they have a bent or a niche that they play where they're designing more energy efficient equipment, great. If they don't, they're basically, and I, I'm not trying to diminish their role at all, but they're kind of just using the same designs that they have used the past three or four or five jobs. That's just typical in the industry because it's they, they've got to make money for their firm and they're typically expediting. and they go with what works and what they know works in a specific instance. I'd say that's fairly common in the industry. The design builders typically, my experience has been that the design builders often lead with you know life cycle costing and let's take these considerations and again we're not taking a position and saying you should or you shall we're giving you the options so my experience has been the design builders and some of the energy services firms would typically be installing more energy efficient equipment i'd say it's a small niche of the industry if we were to look at it i'm suspecting design build as the construction delivery method is you know less than 30 percent of the whole would be my guess Perhaps one way to think about it is design build, there's just one firm, so there's fewer points of failure where non-efficient ideas could enter in and less than best practices can enter in. But then another interface is also once you're done building, you're passing it off to an operating company. How have you seen that transition and handover to someone else? Do they run the equipment that you guys have installed efficiently, or is there another source of potential conflict? That you're, that's a very astute observation. That is absolutely a a challenge in the industry. And there's some real leaders in the industry who, who've taken this on and recognized how, you know, it would not be uncommon. When, when we think about, you know, what happened with LEED, you know, and USGBC and all the things that went on, LEED kind of acknowledged pretty quickly that many of the, and this is early on, I'm going back probably the early 2000s, they acknowledged that a lot of the systems that were designed to the lead standard were not being operated to the same standard. And, and so for whatever reason, there was that disconnect that you've described between what was actually designed and the design intent, and then was actually the working and operating of that system in the buildings. So a lot of companies have acknowledged that and seen it. And there's some leaders in the industry. I had an experience working with the University of Arkansas. I thought they were one of the best organizations having an awareness of how to manage that exact handoff. And they're very keen on having a commissioning agent from the beginning involved with the designers and the engineer all through the entire system until that building was installed and then it was handed off to their operations team to be sure it met the design intent. So I think that will continue to emerge. I honestly, I've been out of touch enough lately to, and I'm not sure how much traction that whole notion of a commissioning, an owner's agent responsible for commissioning of building systems is prevalent in the industry these days. But I feel like that is the, you wanna talk about efficiency. If you and I were building a building, I would insist that we have a commissioning agent working on our behalf from the very beginning to the, to the handoff to an operations organization. Yeah, and just really quickly, what would be the roles and responsibilities of that commissioning agent on behalf of the owner? I'll try to keep this pretty tight. My understanding is not that deep, but I did run a business unit, so I just had really smart people running it for me. Fundamentally, there would be a design meeting at the very conception where all of the stake, the owners, the engineers, the architects, the major contractors would sit down in a room and there would be a document created, which was the owner's design intent. And that document, let's say it's a two or three year project, that document would become the guiding factor in that entire construction installation. And then the commissioning agent working on behalf of the owner would have milestones throughout construction where they would come in and validate that a system was being installed per the owner's intent. And then upon startup of these systems about when you're going to commission that building, that those systems were working to design intent. 
And so that's basically what commission agent's responsibility. And I'm making it very simple. It's a very complex role with a lot of political capabilities required because you're dealing with so many trades and so many stakeholders. When you see something wrong, how do you surface that? How do you raise that? And how do you address the problems that you're discovering throughout the process? It's a, it's a really interesting role that I think should be common. I hope it becomes common. I remember hearing once from a mechanical engineering friend that sometimes it takes up, you know, for skyscrapers, for large, complex engineering systems, make large mechanical systems, it can take up to five years to learn how to run a building properly. And so in some ways, it's trying to shorten that amount of time or, or do the knowledge transfer from one person, one staff person to the next staff person, right? Absolutely. That, that's a very interesting point you're making. If you think about who actually constructed the building and those tradespeople and those managers and those project managers, and then you think about the people who are going to be responsible for that building operates. So take your skyscraper or take a hospital. The knowledge transfer is often really messy. It becomes really messy. And the, the traditional way is you're going to have a new chillers installed for, for cooling. You're going to have the entire technical team from the hospital come in and go through a half a day training from the manufacturer on the chiller. And, and I hate to say this, and I don't, again, don't mean to minimize it, but in all essence, that becomes kind of it. And then there's manuals and they can always go back to the manuals. But when a problem happens, that's where it's so dependent on the operator to really understand intimately how that piece of equipment works and be able to, to manage it and manage the problems and work through them. And it doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's shortcuts taken for obvious and good reasons. And that's how buildings can tend to get out of tolerance with the design intent and start operating inefficiently. Because everybody's just trying to do the best they can and get through the day and make it work. Yeah, I mean, I get frustrated reading the owner's manual of my printer let alone trying to run a multi-million dollar piece of equipment and have it break on me and now scrambling to try to figure out what to do. Yeah. Well, what's really neat is there's some technology emerging. I'm sure common now, I'm going back 10 years probably, that the technology is starting to emerge that was, you know, really geared towards, I might be overstating this a little bit, but folks who are coming into the workforce who were going through technical school, who were maybe graduating from technical school, 18, 20 years old, who had been on devices their whole life who've been gamers or whatever. So there's some really neat technology that's probably out there today that I might be unaware of that is very geared towards that mentality and that mindset to be able to troubleshoot problems with equipment based on video interactions and machine learning and those types of things. That brings up another point. At the end of the day, mechanical contracting, hot water is hot water, cold air is cold air. There's only so many ways from a thermodynamics point of view to produce those products. How have you seen technology evolve over your career? Has it actually changed much or is still fundamentally mostly the same industry? Yeah, I love that. I, when I can have some of my moments where I might get a little bit jaded because a new shiny penny has emerged and you look at the trade publications and I'll often say, hey, you know, I saw that same article 25 years ago. Has anything really changed? And sometimes just adoption. You know, it's the idea that might have been in the 19, late 90s or early 2000s just didn't gain adoption, but people are still kind of championing it. And it's the right thing to do in many cases. It just hasn't gained adoption because it is a simple business. You try to keep these systems as simple as possible. And I'm going a little bit on a tangent here, but the operators, their primary role is to make sure the tenants in the building or the users in a production facility, they're happy and they've got the proper temperature in the room or the proper production environment and the proper operation of equipment, that's their primary focus as well it should be. So the reluctance to now let's try out a new technology that might not in fact be new, might have been, it's just new to them and it's different for them. And they've learned how to spin all those plates to make sure that their particular role in their daily job is being done properly and well, because that's how they pay their rent, how they send their kids to school, et cetera. So that dynamic's always in this industry of the built environment where people just don't jump to change because it makes good sense or it's economical or it is a better way to do things. They are very reliant on under the pressures they're under of cost containment, of trying to get as much done as they can with as limited a staff. They're going to go with what they know works. So therefore, I've always observed there's this inherent dynamic of change is hard to adopt in the built environment. 
Now, all of that said, I always used to say that a mechanical contractor can ride on the backs of the OEMs who are continuously improving their efficiencies. The OEMs have R&D departments, mechanical contractors, energy service companies, they don't need that. They can just ride on those backs and then present it in a fashion that is palatable to the buyer. To answer your question, my observation is there are always innovators trying to get out there and, and reinvent things and do it better. And some of the things I've seen come along are make all the sense in the world and are great innovations, but I find in the industry, the adoption's very, very slow. And there's the shiny penny thing. People, once they get burned by something, in other words, it didn't work the way the expectation was, they become even more reluctant to try the next thing that might make all the sense in the world. And OEMs are the original equipment manufacturer that's manufacturing the devices and the uh, equipments, the widgets in the first place. That's correct. These things. Well, that's a good good observation. And given that you've been in the sector for so long, first of all, what has been one of the most exciting new technologies you've seen over the course of your career? But then also, where have you seen the gaps of, gosh, we just need that solution, but no one's working on that solution? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. The, the obvious thing that comes to mind for me are the advances in lighting technologies. I mean, it seems like every five years, six years, there's more efficient lighting as an example. The other thing that I've seen is, I'm going to get a little granular here. The way we service equipment, the technologies there, I've seen a very interesting thing where I always use this term. What you really need here is a rowboat and the engineers are creating a Queen Mary. So we have over-engineered solutions to what could be really broken down in reasonably simple solutions. So I'll give you an example. If we just thought of a, a heating cooling unit on the roof of a, a building somewhere, all of a sudden somebody in the building's hot or cold. And so they call the facility manager, facility manager then calls the HVAC company. The HVAC company rolls a truck out, gets their ladder out, climbs up on the roof, looks at the piece of equipment and says, oh, it's true, a belt's broken or a compressor's failed or whatever. They climb down their ladder, put it back in the truck, put in an order for that piece of equipment, it might take two days to get there, or they might be able to go to the supply house and get it. They turn around, they go back to the building, ladder up, replace it. If we just mapped out that process, what I have yet to see is a broadly adopted model where Wi-Fi technology or something of that sort can be used. I know there's a lot of companies working on this right now. I just haven't seen it where it's widely adopted yet. Before that technician even goes there, they already know the problem and the, the, the machine learning has determined what is the problem at that piece of equipment. And for me, that could be very simple stuff like, you know, there's five operating parameters that could be monitored, sent on, you know, through Wi-Fi and then downloaded into the cloud that anybody could access and understand. Those are definitely emerging. emerging. I just haven't seen the solution that's been broadly adopted for many conflicting reasons. Do you think that has something to do with this first adoption versus life cycle adoption? We've talked about it from a cost point of view, but have you also seen that from a focus of innovation point of view? Are there more innovations at the install than innovations at the ongoing operations? Yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm not clear on, for example, what are the motivations for the original equipment manufacturers to solve that problem I just described? Why wouldn't they just have an onboard module you could buy with the equipment? I'm sure they do, quite honestly. But why isn't it right there really innovative and common? I haven't seen that. So the real rub that I, I guess I'm experiencing is in the operation of the building, that whole process I described it actually works. It might not be the most efficient process, but there's a lot of people involved in that whole process that have figured out a way to make it work and get that piece of equipment repaired. And to introduce change into that process can be a very daunting thing for a company who is making money doing what they're doing. For example, that mechanical services provider they're making money doing it the way they're doing it. Now we're going to introduce something to change. A whole lot of people have to learn a whole lot of different stuff. So it, in some ways, it's changing the supply chain. And when one starts thinking about changing the supply chain, there's the winners and losers. And then the losers are going to be defensive about resisting that change. 
That's absolutely correct. It's absolutely a supply chain challenge and changing changes to the supply chain is the technology is there and ready, I'm sure. Now it's just, it's the change management of people and organizations that are going to have an impact. And that actually gets into the larger mechanical contractor ecosystems. Comfort system is, I think, the country's largest, if not the world's largest mechanical contractor, but yet how many thousands of mechanical contractor companies are there in the U.S.? I think it's like 20,000. I could be off, you know, by a factor of, of 100%, but I, it's a lot. Yeah, and it could be a single guy just with a ladder and a truck all the way to, mm -hmm. you know, large, sophisticated companies like what you used to run. How would you learn about a new technology? Would it be through industry? Would it be through your staff? What was the, the usual avenue for you to learn a new energy efficiency technology? Yeah, good. Interestingly, when I was running Comfort Systems USA Energy Services, one of the roles I did play was try to sort through emerging technologies. And Comfort, you know, I'm very impressed with their general management is they would tend to be followers for technology. They're not going to be leaders. Typically, sometimes they are, but typically they would, hey, let's let it get tested out. Let's let others try it and then we'll adopt. So I would just through my network, you know, making sure I'm going to Greenbuild and other shows now and again, or a lot of folks would steer the calls from the industry, from the salespeople. I'd be kind of that screen. And so that's how I became aware of a lot of the technologies. And I was doing that from about 2008 to 2013, 14. And that was one of the roles I played is let's sort through the technology. And it came from all different angles. And it really came from me also having really smart people on the team who I did rely on, who are just brilliant engineers. If they were seeing something out there, let's talk about it. Is this something we should introduce to the organization as a whole? And that became another a key source because we have folks out there commissioning buildings, for example, are working on designing energy efficient systems. When you screened a technology and you found it acceptable and okay, what was it like pushing it down into the operating companies and the people on the ground? Were they quick to adopt, slow to adopt? Did you find a mix? Well, let me tell you, first of all, kind of the process that Comfort typically follows. They would have a champion. In the case where I was involved, it would be me. And I'd say, folks, we have an opportunity here. I'd put you know, an email out to the appropriate leaders of the different units. And I'd say, if this is something you're interested in, we're going to conduct a pilot. Would you be interested in participating? And so out of that, we'd get a half a dozen who said, yeah, let's take a look at that. And that speaks to your question. What I found with, I'm sure, any kind of roll up of different operating companies, you had some who were very progressive in their thinking, had, you know, technology minded people as leaders and were very cautious, but they were also very open to the next technology that they wanted to get a competitive advantage with. And then on the other end of the continuum, you'd have the very typical conservative contractors who, like I said before, I'm not knocking that at all. They make money. They do well. They supported fam many, many families and high for many, many people. And they just tend to be less conservative, uh, more conservative. And they'll let those folks in the comfort systems family who are more inclined to go test and try and pilot and then take their feedback. And that's how broad adoption might take place at a company like Comfort Systems. Did you find then pushback from customers beyond the operating companies, whether they were excited or did they have pushback on these new technologies that were getting implemented? You know, that's really a wonderful question. And if I were to generalize, I would say there was typically pushback in a, a significant enough percentage an openness because of the trust they had in comfort systems, but pushback was very, very common. For example, you know, we had a technology company we were working with to do what I had described is let's, let's just monitor in a very simple fashion, some points on this unit. And it was not unusual for the facility manager to say, oh no, no, I don't want you bolting this to my equipment. That adds yet another complexity to that relationship. We're going to do something different. Humans are just inclined against change. It's just human nature. So that would happen all the time. I mean, those types of things. You know, Comfort System being a national company, the climate of Arizona is going to be completely different than the climate of Chicago. Let's say I'm talking about the weather. 
how would the technologies have to be adopted in different, especially if you're sourcing new technologies? Would you ever source a technology and say, well, this will only work in Florida. It's not applicable to Nevada. And how would you make those sorts of filters and decisions? Yeah, absolutely. Some's come to mind. I, I, I'm reluctant to just bring up the technology because they have a lot of good salespeople. That exact thing. We knew this technology from an, when we had energy engineers analyze performance we realized that north of the Mates and Dixon line, this thing worked perfectly and delivered the efficiency that was expected. Typically south of the Mates and Dixon line, it didn't. It had other characteristics that it worked fine for certain applications. It just didn't deliver on the energy efficiency promise. So absolutely we saw that. You know, I can't remember how many climate zones are on the US, but it was a factor depending on the technology. Yeah, I think it's like 11 or something like that. It, that it sounds is right. quite a number depending on temperature and humidity and all different sorts of values. You know, I think people have a perception that an air conditioner is an air conditioner. And yet when you change different climates, the efficiency of how it functions is totally different. That's right. That's right. And some of the stuff we used to see that there's cottage industries that if you're near the ocean, the damage the salt water does to this equipment that's sitting on a roof is phenomenal. There are solutions out there that they make their livings just treating that equipment and you know, making it effective in that type of harsh environment. So in your career, where did you see that you had the authority to make decisions really fast? And where did you really want to slow decisions and say, wait a minute, we got to think about this a little bit more? So in the context of operating a company, Yes. Yeah. I was very, very fortunate to have a lot of autonomy, as most of the comfort systems operating companies have. We had to deliver, obviously, on budget, et cetera, et cetera. The philosophy that I had at our company was we had some, like I said before, I can't tell you about this enough, some really smart people working for us. And so our philosophy was just fail fast. You know, if something comes in, we would get the right people in the room, we'd have at it for whatever it took, an hour, two, three, about an opportunity to make some changes and make some decisions. And everybody would get the chance to present their perspective. And then collectively, we would decide. And if we were going to make a decision, we were going to go as fast as we possibly could and then adjust what happened going forward. If, if there was a change and it didn't work out the way we thought, we'd simply reassess. Our, it wasn't unusual. I can recall a couple instances. We literally just took the hit, said, okay, that was a mistake. We're going to stop doing that. But we're pretty good at that, I think, as an organization, just simply because we had some smart people working on it. And what were some examples of wanting to slow down and saying, well, we need to, we can't make that decision today. We got to get more information. The actual situation in a large corporation like that was, who else might this impact? If this could have uh, any kind of negative impact on an operating company, another a sister operating company, or even reflect poorly on comfort, if we were taking that kind of risk, we would never, we would move very slowly and we'd engage a whole bunch of people to get other opinions, particularly those who might be impacted. Gotcha. So you want to go fast on some of the new ideas that you were bringing in, but you would go really slow on what's the broader risk to the company if there is any. Yeah, for sure. And to be very specific, the saying, I don't know if it still is, but I just used to have this thought and I'm sure it came from some of the senior leaders at Comfort that one job, even though it's a holding company, one job that goes bad could have a very negative impact on the entire corporation, you, you know, even though these are separate operating companies. So when it came to job specific stuff and making those decisions, we were very cautious, very slowly and deliberately. And, and then when there's a challenge or problem that arise, some we had resources at corporate who could come in and help us. Hey, what's the right approach here? Because they'll have legal impacts, legal implications, those types of things. But when it came down to new technology stuff, we would assess things with kind of what I call that critical eye. But when we made a decision to go, we would kind of map out, here's the milestone where we're going to assess what has it happened the way we thought it would. And do we go forward or do we cut it there? That's a caution, but we would also move very quickly to, to take the measures to really test things out like that. Where do you see the need for expertise in the future? What's the biggest need for skills in the future? So I'll speak first to the big industry, the macro industry issue. It's surely technicians, technical tradespeople. 
the workforce is aging and it, it is quite interesting and shocking. And the, the whole thing about this notion that people are going to come out of high school and go to college, that, that that is the preferred path. I couldn't debunk that enough. I mean, it just it's just simply not true. Not everybody's cut out for college education. Some people are, in fact, would be great at trades and can make a good living. That's the big challenge in the industry as a whole. That notion of people who are going to continue to go look at that plot of land over there and make something come out of nothing. The people who build things. It's a very noble, noble business. Uh, on the other end, I, I see that I've always admired engineers in general, engineers who are thinking about how can we do things better. And this might sound a little jaded, but what I've noticed is when people get into the workforce, it does become kind of a production mentality, even in the engineering environment. And so I'd love to see, and I, I think there needs to be really smart, innovative people working on these things that aren't that sexy. You know, it's about how a building operates. It's how this operates. It's not how we're going to send people to inhabit Mars, you know. It's just not that high profile stuff. So I think there's a real need there to attract people who want to solve those kind of problems that absolutely have an impact on everybody's daily lives, you know, how they are in buildings, what they do when they're in those buildings. And I'm just, again, optimistic that we're going to continue to get that influx of people that come in that make a difference in that environment. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. It was nice speaking with you. You have been listening to the Levers for Change podcast, where we search for who has responsibility for what when implementing change. My name is Jimmy Gia, and the music is by Sean Hart. Please subscribe to our podcast for new episodes and share with a friend. Please visit our website at www.leversforchangepodcast.com for additional episodes, books, and other resources. Thank you again, and remember, when trying to change the world, search for your levers for change.